Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, joining for these uh, lightning talks. My name is Sylvain Halle. I'm currently working as a postdoc in University of California, Santa Barbara. And I would like to uh, take these next five minutes doing my elevator pitch about um, uh, work I've been working on in the past year. And it's uh, validation and monitoring of uh, interface contracts, and especially in web applications. So the context in which I'm doing my work is actually this. So you have a small web application on some random server that's actually using a third party uh, web service in the background. Uh, here I have Amazon.com as an example, but you could think of any other web service provider that actually provides functionality that can be used in the background for any web application. And we're talking, uh, we're thinking about these applications at the message level. So actually, you have here a request, for example, that the application does to the Amazon server about a specific item. And then Amazon replies with a list of items. And in particular, we're thinking about these messages in terms of their XML content. So we're actually working at the SOAP XML level of monitoring. And actually, when you interact with such a web service, uh, there are some constraints that you have to follow in order to have a uh, valid interaction with that service. Here you have an example of uh, five different messages where you actually ask for some item, get the answer back, create a new shopping cart with some of these items inside. You have the response from the web application give, giving you a cart ID. And then you want to add one more of one of these items into your shopping cart, and the application replies you with an error message. And actually, this is actually taken from one of Amazon's web services. And the constraint is that you cannot add the same item twice to the shopping cart. And this is an actual constraint. And the question is, well, how do I know about these constraints? How can I check these things automatically? And actually, if you look into, this is a, a screenshot from Amazon's actual documentation for that service, which is the e-commerce service. And if you look in that documentation, indeed, at some point in that documentation, you have the list of error messages. And one of them tells you what happens if you try to add the same item twice to your shopping cart. So you shouldn't try that. So we invented a language where you can express these kinds of properties. So you have properties over messages. And then we also have temporal operators that express something about the sequence of these messages. And then we also have some kind of quantification on elements so that you don't need to repeat the same property for all items in Amazon's catalog. Now, and it's called LTL FO+. And what we do is, well, two things. Uh, we can record the messages to a persistent storage and then check this trace for violations. Or we can also intercept these messages as they are produced and raise a flag when something bad happens. This is called runtime monitoring. And beep beep is actually a tool that we produced and it acts as a kind of policeman. So when the application, so it has in memory the kind of contract that it has to monitor. And then when the application tries to send messages, well, if it's OK, it relays it to the application as expected. But if it's not, it will block the message. And instead, this message will be thrown away, and the application can be notified by the error. So if you want to add this monitor to a real application, well, we have a tool. You can download it. And then you just need to include it to your application by doing two modifications, one to the HTML code where you include a JavaScript file, and the other one in your JavaScript file, actually, where you call R class that does the monitoring. And that's it. Um, and then you have a contract file that actually defines what are the properties that the, the monitor wants to validate. So the take home points to conclude is that a contract is a sequence of constraints on a mixture of sequences of operation and data parameters. We have a tool that's called BB that can monitor and enforce these contracts at runtime. It's open source, you can download it. We have a website. And if you want more details, I have a flyer here. So if you want to have a copy of this flyer, well, feel free to, um, to have one. Otherwise, go to the website. And please do contact me if you have any idea of application for using this thing. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks. So I'm glad I'm able to share with you a concern I've had uh, uh, ever since I've started uh, my career. And I still have that concern today. And hopefully, that can lead to discussion today or tomorrow. 
Um, when I was a developer on any given day, I had a developer coming to my desk and telling me, Fred, I found you know, five bugs. OK, whatever. I'll take a look later. The next day, that same person said, you know, today I found 20 bugs. You know, I rock. You suck. But, well, it bring my attention. So I look at the bug and um, find out that, well, a lot of these bugs were not really, well, business critical. And we can argue what's uh, uh, business critical. And I didn't have enough information about them, um, how to refuse the problem, operating system, uh, information about, about that actual bug. Um, Oops. Then, um, when I was working, I saw you know testing competition, which is good. It's good for motivation. It's good for tester. Uh, but the the goal was to find the maximum bugs, which for me was was a bit strange. And then in some um, objective for tester, the goal was to find you know the maximum amount of bugs. I was bothered by that. And. No later than today, a person received an award, which is good. I'm sure she did a great job. But there was one comment that bothered me. And it was, well, she did a great job. So far, she found 700 bugs. So there is two problems here. There is, we still uh, value quantity about, uh, versus quality of the actual bug. And we still perceive tester as uh, people finding bugs instead of finding important bugs and helping fix them. So we can argue about what's an important bug, and it could vary in some country, an ATM crashing um, like every, I don't know, 30 days for 20 minutes might not be important. In Japan, for example, a system could be up and running for seven years, and it failed 20 minutes, and you got a CEO of the company, it was IBM at the time, Lou Gershton, flying the next day to apologize. That's a problem. Uh, AdSense crashing, it's a problem. You got people relying on making money with AdSense. That's a problem. So we need to make sure tester, and it's a challenge for tester because sometimes they sit so far from the business, so they don't really grasp what's important. That's the first thing. The second thing is let's make sure they help fix the bugs. So they bring as much information as possible about the bugs, operating system, uh, um, what's the step to recreate the problem, what's the, I don't know, it could be fragmentation level on disk at the time, because it's important for that particular um, application, network status at that particular time. And well, so, some could see that as uh, very difficult and kind of boring to report, but you can make it fun. You can, I mean, we're in an automation conference, so let's make that fun. And automating the actual reporting, the actual aggregating of data, the actual draining of data, the actual, you know, performance testing is a good example. There is a lot of data. You aggregate your data. You can use Cube OLAP to drill and to pinpoint the problem. So we need to encourage tester to actually bring valuable information and really change the, the perception that they're only here to fix bug, but really to help fix the bug. There is a, a good article from, uh, what's his name, Ken Cern um, on the web. It's called Bug Advocacy, and it's called uh, Stomping Bugs and Make Friends. Friends are developer. And so I encourage everyone to read that because it's really good and brings some good information. Thank you. He said to you, uh, okay, uh, 10 developers, they have to create uh, programs which load data into this database schema. Uh, is, no, which uh, use this database schema to, to make so, some jobs. So please, uh, let's check that the programs are working. And um, so what you do, you have to create test data, you know. 
And what you do almost of, of the time, you type. You type, uh, you have a table with uh, 10 fields, you, you type in the table. But the table has also uh, three constraint, uh, uh, three unique key, unique key, and one primary key, uh, and three foreign keys. So uh, at the end, you get mad. What you can do? You can use DB feeder. With DB feeder, what he, what he does, he just analyzes the database schema. I must say, an Oracle database schema is actually tuned only for Oracle. Uh, he, he reads the foreign key, unique key, primary keys, um, and then you press a button, you get the data. That's the basic idea of DB feeder. But there is also second idea is now I become troubles. Second idea is, mm. <laughs> how do I get to this page? So um, actually, DB feeder is, is uh, quite uh, with a very modern GUI, GUI uh, <laughs> number based. You can choose your numbers and uh, uh, to create pro projects, to to insert password for database. Uh, here I took as an example HR, uh, HR um, with, with uh, the HR schema of Oracle, very well known um, demo schema of Oracle. Uh, um, um, how many minutes I have still? Three. Okay, thank you. Um, you it, so and then it start to analyze. Uh, the depth of the um, of the tables. So you start the uh, job region are, are so some kind of root tables. Then countries are uh, related to regions. Then locations, departments uh, like, like Google department in Zurich, uh, employees of Google, and then the job history of the employees is the 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 at the uh, tab number five. Uh, that is uh, first step analyzed. Uh, then um, the feeder um, works on some kind of configuration files. Um, quite a long history wh where you can you can set the type of the data that you want. Uh, then you press a button and you get the data. And uh, um, uh, I have to uh, go down. Uh, here is the point where it is inserting data. I'm very happy that I have only five minute talk, so I don't have to do any demo and <laughs> then to, to demonstrate that it's working. Um, and now I want to, uh, there is also a second part of DB feeder, which is called data generate. I will quickly speak about this. This module is actually let, letting you to, to configure the data uh, uh, the basic idea of this module uh, at the time when I was creating the feeder is how I can create uh, the data, I char characterize the data in an, uh, in an efficient way. And then I got the idea from the regex and I put it upside down. I used a regex to, to create uh, data instead of filtering data. And this way you can configure your data uh, for each column and, and then uh, which is uh, in the database and in this way um, tune your data for the database. And uh, I hope you, you enjoy the Befeeder is free, is in, uh, in um, SourceForge, uh, um, data generated is also free, it's written in Perl, it's in CPAN, and if you have more questions, please uh, contact direct me, I would uh, very like, uh, I would very enjoy if you, if you come to me. All right, so the talk I put on here is every test should look like every test should look like an iPhone commercial, but uh, the other title for this talk um, is Watch the Fine Video is the new Read the Fine Manual. Uh, so I'm Jason Huggins, uh, creator of Selenium, also co-founder at Sauce Labs. I'm Hugs at SauceLabs.com. I'm also uh, Jay Huggins on Twitter. Uh, brief history of Sauce Labs is I'm a creator of Selenium. I uh, was a form, I'm a former Googler, worked on the Selenium farm there, and now Sauce Labs is uh, the same thing. Selenium in the cloud. So cloud computing is this big old hyped thing. Well, I'm actually doing that. So uh, we're your outsourced test lab. 
And uh, well, anyway, I should get on with my slides. That's a brief history of Sauce Labs. So a brief history of film. Right, history, film has been around for 100 years or so. They've got a good lead on software development. So a brief history of film. For 30 years there, there were silent films and then everything else. Uh, so between 1900 and 1927, I'm not going to play the clip because I don't have enough time, but you watch Three, Three Amigos and you've got these silent films that they show. So the, the link here actually works, but I'm not going to click it. Um, but then everything after that is talkies, which we all know is just regular movies. But at the time, there were talkies, a massive, huge improvement about 30 years into the film industry. The specific movie was The Jazz Singer. I'm not going to play the clip because I don't have time. So anyway, let's keep moving on. The key technology, though, at the time was the movie theater. That was the key thing that let you go see this massive new technology. You didn't have to buy it. You just go to the movie theater. You watch the movies. Uh, now a brief history of computers. So. Uh, <laughs> Briefly, there's, I call it the silent documentation. Remember, think of the title of the talk, that read the, watch the fine video is the new RTFM. Between 1979 and 2004, two very important dates, we had the silent documentation era. Roughly, it's everything started with VisiCalc, Apple II. Everything ended this era with, I'm oh, sorry, at the time, documentation was just known as read the fine manual, right? Well, everything changed in 2004. 2004 is when Ruby on Rails came out, and this jerk, I'm a Python guy, so I can call him a jerk. But uh, to his credit, he did some novel thing. He created screencasts, right? He invented it, of course. Uh, of course, he did it uh, in QuickTime and did it in Rails and Apple, all that stuff like that. But I'm going to make this quick analogy that Rails screencast, the very initial one in 2004, is as important to the cosmic history of the universe as Jazz Singer was in 1927. So the key technology now, fast forward, is YouTube. Of course. The video that they produced was QuickTime and not put on YouTube. But I'm just going to say, you know, in the history of time, YouTube will just be credited as the key technology for video being the future. So what comes next? And so I'll show you a demo. <laughs> so now going back to the other talk, every test should look like an iPhone commercial. When got minutes, I've got I've got two minutes left on my uh, clock here. So if I can find, I'm going to lose my uh, right. So if I just click play. I watched this, there was a good six months when iPhone existed as a thing, but didn't actually exist as a thing you could buy. And so Apple puts this video up on their website. This, this is, I just downloaded it from, again, I guess I pulled it from YouTube, made sure it was running local so I didn't have to play it, see it break. But um, this effectively is test automation. Like you're opening, every iPhone commercial is like this. You launch an app, you click around, you type some stuff, and like this is what they put, this is, I look at this and say this is test automation. But I, Apple looks at this and say like, oh, this is actually what they use to sell product. And I think actually as a test profession, we should all aspire to make our tests this beautiful. So of course, what is the key technology to kind of do this kind of thing? I've got about almost a minute here. So I'm going to pause this and I'm going to show you now this isn't just hype. This is actually an improvement on my GLTAC talk three years ago in London. I actually now have some working stuff around here. Uh, so really, I've took this existing library called Pi VNC to Swift, which I did show at LTAC three years ago. I've now made it as wonderful as this API. You instantiate the object, start and stop. Basically, this is a video recording library. So you can start video, do something awesome, then stop the video. So you combine test automation with video recording, and now you have your, the, at least the possibility of iPhone commercials. So what I'm going to show you briefly is a, a web driver test combined with my video library. And I've got 30 seconds. So I'm going to show this playing. And maybe I'll let it finish. But really, it's, it's uh, launching the browser, doing your canonical browser test of doing a Hello Google kind of a test and closing it. So now if I go over here, I'm uh, going to click Play. And this is the video that it has recorded. Now processed as a flash video, I could put this. I'm serving it from my own server. I could put this up on YouTube, important technology, and make this uh, my documentation that people would use. I've got 10 seconds. And all I will say is this isn't just theory. At Sauce Labs, we record a video of every test. Last time I measured it, we did 50, 000, we've done 50,000 of these tests. I think it's probably more maybe at the 75,000 range. So this isn't just theory. It's not just a broken theory from uh, a, a code from LTAC. I'm actually doing this in production every day, tens of thousands of times. And I'm out of time. That's my talk. Hop. So um, this came to my mind during today's presentation. I was wondering how can I test my cappuccino. So 
until my doctor asked me to stop drinking milk, I used to love cappuccinos. And uh, for everyone who went to Starbucks already, uh, they know that when they prepare a cappuccino, they give you the cappuccino and they give you the sugar because I cannot drink coffee without sugar. So my problem in this configuration was how do I add the sugar to the cappuccino, saving the foam? Because if you drop the sugar on top of the foam and you mix everything, it's not a cappuccino anymore. So I used to have some, strat some hacks in order to <laughs> attempt to have some sugar in my cappuccino. The first one was to lift the foam. <laughs> really, really hard task to just lift the foam, put the sugar, and then put the foam back. I just tried once. My second try <laughs> was to use a straw. <laughs> but hot coffee, drinking with a straw is horrible. I also only try it once. So I tried to think about strategies. And I came with two strategies. The first one was, why not delivering a do-it-yourself cappuccino kit? So I asked to Starbucks, can you give me the coffee? Give me the foam aside the coffee, so I could mix the coffee and the sugar, and then put the foam on it. Unfortunately, they refused to give me the kit. So that wasn't a good solution. The second solution was to integrate the user so that when they prepare the cappuccino, I would say stop just before they put the foam. So I can put the sugar, mix the sugar, and then they put the foam on the coffee. When I was alone in the Starbucks, it was OK. But with 20 people behind me, <laughs> they wouldn't agree on integrating the user in the process of making the cappuccino. So GTAC, you've got A for automation. But everything I just said is, can be summarized to one simple question. Do you have a strategy to integrate the user in your process? How can we mix, or how do you mix, automated testing from the user. They can test the form, they can test the coffee, but they can't test how I put sugar in my coffee. And from one uh, drink to another, it may change, because if it's white sugar, it's not the same amount of sugar as when it's brown sugar. It's, it's a problem. So how do you mix the part that we can automate in our testing, in our process? with the part which has to be done in front of the end user. This is one of the problems I've got, actually, in some of uh, my development. And that's what the, uh, the idea of the talk. What I heard today underlined me that this is an uh, important and very difficult problem to mix automation with end user feedback. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, so this is just kind of a transcript into presentation form of a document I wrote while I was exploring a problem last week. And there weren't a lot of presentations when I signed up, so um, I thought it might interest some of you. Uh, my name is Alec Monroe. I work for Research in Motion. Um, I have no formal computer science training, so some of the things I'm going to suggest here may even contravene everything you've ever heard. You're probably right. but. Save your booing until I'm off the stage, please. Um, so the particular problem that um, I was addressing was how to write a data class that integrates into my application. Um, and it, it itself is testable, and the application and other components that use it remain testable. And by data class, I mean, in this case, something that represents an XML file. Um, so it's a request and a response. Request could look like that. It doesn't really, but it'll do. Um, 
this is some ways I thought we could build a request. Because a request is just a list of providers, but we may want to take an existing file, we may want to take an XML document or an XML object that already exists, um, or we may want to just parse out some text. So that's pretty straightforward stuff. I figured we need a base class that just does those things. Um, so we have a request that inherits from XML file, which is something you're not going to see. Um, but processing data. Processing data is where I thought it got interesting. Um, in this case, there's two examples. They're, um, well, finding the sum of a sequence of values represented in an XML file. Both of these come from the response, actually. Um, we're not going to talk about that one because I didn't write about it. It was fairly simple. Um, the other one was validating kind of that certain elements are nested within a given response document, um, which we're going to call download availability. So one way we could have a download availability method or download available method is to have it on the object itself. Um, but unfortunately, the fact that a download is available or not is really specific to our usage of the request object or response object in this case. Um, so I figured that wasn't a very good way to do it. So I thought, OK, oh, well, there's supposed to be a static method in there where that's called download available. And you pass in a response, the uh, what I called start and end. Um, and as far as you know, that death to testability is a link to Misko Hevery's blog post of the same thing, or same name. Um, so I'm not going to explain why static methods are death, death to testability, because it's fairly long and a very involved discussion that I don't feel too, too qualified to get into. <laughs> um, so I thought, OK, my application can check it out. But in this case, our app, the application ends up OK, um, hiding the functionality from other potential users. And our application, whoever is using it, needs to understand the format of the XML file or the XML data. So the final solution is that um, we move the, any data management to the response object. So um, if we want to just get all of the downloads that are available there, we add a get downloads to res the response object. Um, and then we create a download utility, which is, in this case, the usage is specific to my application, but anyone could take it, extend it without needing to know much about my application, or particularly the format of the XML data. Um, and I mean, this, this all works well for separation of concerns, for dependency injection. Um, and then there's one last thing about long-term concerns. Um, the response object is traditionally, um, I think, about 94 kilobytes. Um, so there's an incredible amount of data in there. I only cared about these two cases, so I only wrote logic to work with it. Um, but I now have, I think, three different classes that are using it in some form or another, and other people may use. So to make sure that when other people do end up using them, um, they don't break my code, I figure using, using keyword arguments is, helps. It's not going not gonna to guarantee it. Um, so that's, that's my talk. It says I've been five minutes and six seconds, according to this. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I'm not talking about um, um, techniques um, of automated testing, but I, um, I'm talking about um, the mindset behind, especially in agile environments. So I called my talk Five Ways to Improve Your um, Developer's Sense of Quality. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. My name is Christiane Phillips, um, and I used to be head of QA at StudiBZ, it's the biggest social network in Germany with over 50 million people. Um, but I decided to leave now uh, in order to look for some new adventures. 
And uh, I'm a little bit obsessed about Agile. I love Agile very much. And we started introducing Scrum in March this year at StudiBZ. So I think many, many companies um, are now in this transformation process from, from waterfall into to an Agile process. And what's the problem behind? I think the, the main problem is uh, the question of quality. And um, I picked up um, two things. So um, de developers must uh, stop relying on the QA guys. Um, um, of course, you heard um, something about uh, this is not my job. Quality is not my job. It's, uh, it's the QA guy's job. And um, some QA guys um, take over this responsibility from the developers and feel themselves as quality police. And I think this is a big mistake. So what, we, what can we do here? Um, first, um, let testers and developers work together very closely. That means um, let them work in one team. Because um, working in one team, yeah? Ah, OK. Working in, <laughs> um, Working in one team makes them learn from each other. That's um, more important. So second, um, improve testers' technical skills. That means um, um, teach testers uh, in a technical way so um, that they can improve um, their developers' knowledge about testability. That's very important. So third, convince your senior developers. Um, why that? Because senior developers have um, a huge influence to your whole team. If you got the senior developers on your side, you have the whole team. Fourth, shorten post-development time. What does this mean? I give you an example. Um, when we started um, with Scrum, at StudiBZ, we had two and a half days afterwards, after development, in order to test the code. What happened? Um, developers relied on that they had enough time to fine tuning their code in this time. So um, because of that, we decided to shorten the two and a half days to just a half day. And yes just a half day, in order to make clear that um, caring for quality is not the QA guy's job. And it's not a job um, um, made, made afterwards. Yeah? It's a job by, by uh, coding. So the last one, provide feedback in a very quick, reliable, and visible way, um, especially in your continuous integration environment. Quick means. Um, the developers have to um, get very quick feedback uh, in, uh, when they run their tests. And reliably, uh, reliable means that um, your continuous integration environment has to be stable. If it's not stable, um, developers don't trust it. Yeah? And then they don't use it. And visible means you should use huge monitors in order to give them feedback they, they cannot ignore. Yeah? Um, the best way to do this is to place huge monitors um, close to the coffee machine. Yeah? yeah. So I'm sure that uh, there are many thousands of ways to, to improve um, the sense of quality. But uh, these are my five favorites. And I would be looking forward to get more ideas uh, from you. OK, thanks. OK, um, I'm not talking about testing. Actually, I'm a PhD student. I'm working on artificial intelligence. So I'm talking something about classification. And um, so I'm working with machine learning. The idea is that if you have the data, how can we extract the knowledge from the data? OK? That was normally done by humans. But the idea for machine learning is we develop software, we develop algorithm to do this using computer. Okay? And in machine learning, it, this awareness concept is we believe that 
the knowledge is just data plus some generalization. And generalization is actually a very dangerous concept, isn't it? Because if you think about it, Isaac Newton, he saw the apple drop up from the tree and he discovered this universal gravitation. This is generalization. But some person who wear a dirty shoe and win a football match, and from then on, he always wear dirty shoes when playing football. He believed that dirty shoes bring him luck. This is also generalization. All right? So this kind of difference actually also in terms of classification, it's also have the similar problem. So we have the data, we have the green parts, we have also this, uh, oh, sorry, we have the blue parts and we have also the red parts. And uh, we have the two kind of different decision boundaries. Actually, if you see this, this green boundary actually perfectly classifies the two different types of balls. But the thing is, we only care about the performance in terms of future uh, instance, not only the thing what we already have. So, in fact, we would prefer that this simple black boundary in practice. Okay, so it's kind of like generalization. How can you make a safe generalization? And uh, this is actually not easy uh, because uh, oh, one major reason why we do it is we want to reduce the human effort on doing such kind of things. But that is not the only reason because we know that sometimes humans just cannot do it. It turns out that in very complex circumstances, humans really suck, okay? Because human uh, perception is fuzzy, okay? Human reasoning is not robust towards noise. So here's what we do. Oops. It's about 50 minutes, uh, seconds. So. He has no idea. <laughs> it calls change blindness in uh, neuroscience. So it's very famous, uh, uh, say, kind of scenario which human perception sucks. And there's another example. Oh. Okay, uh, so this is a black and white picture. And uh, I, I would like you to just Look at this picture and please concentrate on the black dot. Just look at the black dot and don't move. Don't move. And anybody see any color picture here? All right, you should. But actually what just happens here is when you saw this picture, the color picture, actually you try to remember the picture. And when that suddenly change, your brain cannot adapt it. So it's kind of like an illusion, right? So human perception again. So again, what, what is a multi-label classification? As convention, uh, conventional classification is uh, from the label set. We have a set of labels. I pick one of them. A multi-label classification is different in the sense that instead of only pick one of them, I pick a set of them. It seems like it's an easy extension, but actually the things get much more complicated here because when we have to pick a set of labels, we have to consider the correlation of labels. So here is an example. If you have a paper which is related to computer science, it's more likely related to also mathematics rather than law. And this, uh, this correlation is crucial in multi-label classification. And multi-label classification can have a lot of different applications. For example, in Flickr, you can take a picture and one single picture at the same time, it has different labels. And for example, in social bookmarking, that uh, a website, for example, Twitter on Delicious, it can at the same time belongs to web to world, social, community, and so on, All right? Some of the system are already implemented. I think that Google should also just use such kind of multi-level classification in, for example, Google Mail. When we have an email, now what we do is a human will send a tag, send a label to the mail. But if you could 
implement automated system, automated system which can assign this label automatically to any e emails. So it can save a lot of time of the human. Uh, so this is all from my side. And uh, if you want more uh, technical details on how to realize a multi-label system, we have developed a system on this. You can just check my website. And uh, I also have some uh, more technical uh, talks on uh, videolecture.net. You can just search uh, my name and find some other uh, talks. So thank you very much. So I have to say, I'm really proud of you guys. We had eight talks in 47 minutes. Right? That was Swiss. <laughs> very, very, very Swiss. So thank you all for staying on time. I think these were very nice, uh, fun at some times, and interesting talks. Uh, tomorrow we start a bit earlier than today. Let me double check. I think it's, uh, yeah, 8 o'clock is breakfast. 9 o'clock is opening talk. So you had to get here a bit earlier than today, probably. Hope to see you all back. I hope you enjoyed day one. There is more coming tomorrow. Until then, have a good night. <laughs>